Hello and welcome everyone to this week's lecture. In this week's lecture, I'll be talking about masonry as a construction material. So the learning outcomes for today, I'll be describing what masonry is. I'll be giving a brief history of masonry. We'll be talking about masonry as a material, discussing masonry design, talking about the individual units making up masonry structures. And then finally, we'll talk about the concept of bonds in masonry structures. So starting off with station one, what is masonry? As you can see in the photo, this is a column and you've got your exterior wall of a particular building and you see these individual units that are stacked together and bound by a thin line of mortar so that's basically how a masonry structure looks like um, it's composed of individual units that are laid on top of one another or next to each other and the bond between these individual units is a thin film of mortar. Now masonry is mainly used for walls of your buildings um, and some retaining walls as well. The durability of your masonry structure depends on the quality of the mortar that connects the individual units together and also on the laying pattern. Station two for today, a brief history of masonry. So if we look at the um, historical context when it comes to masonry structures, uh, masonry structures, they date back to 2600 BC, and that's with the pyramids. So the pyramids, they're constructed of, you know, these individual masonry units uh, that are kind of stacked one on top of the other. You also have another example, which is the Great Wall of China, again, composed of masonry structures uh, connected to one another. Um, when it comes to uh, the pyramids, it's the, the type of uh, masonry that's, that was used. It was limestone, so the individual units were made of limestone. The Great Wall of China, um, initially it was stones and then uh, bricks, clay bricks were added um, after, you know, probably after a thousand years when it was initially constructed. So that's where, you know, the whole concept of masonry structures started. It was back in 2600 BC. If we move forward in time to the Middle Ages, so we're talking about the 5th to 15th century, stone was the most frequently used uh, building unit when it came to masonry structures and it was used to build castles bridges cathedrals uh, and mosques so you see an example over here uh, of alhambra in uh, andalusia um, and you know the amount of architecture that was achievable through the use of you know these individual unit blocks is just amazing uh, a lot of the structures that were built in the Middle Ages, they used stone as their masonry units. And the reason that stone was used was because it was able to support the heavier superstructures. When it came to the Industrial Revolution, of course, new technology was introduced to the market. And this technology made it easier to transport, to quarry materials. So there was a massive expansion in terms of masonry structures. Um, and you can see an example over here in the UK. Um, but yeah, it's, it was basically all to do with, you know, the fact that it was more efficient, more productive to lay these individual units on top of one another. And that led to a massive boom in uh, masonry structures during the Industrial Revolution. For modern times, so it's not 
a very commonly adopted you know construction material or or a construction uh, structure in itself masonry uh, the reason for that is because it was replaced with more efficient techniques and that whole process of the dick wine started in the late 19th century uh, particularly after the introduction of metal frames and these metal frames they replaced the stone bearing walls in very tall buildings so for your high-rise buildings you don't see bricks being used as the main structural component having said that however there are still buildings that are constructed from masonry we see an example at the top over here that's in australia um, and then you know an architectural feature as well a building at the bottom over here in the us but with these uh, modern structures what we see is that there's the incorporation of steel reinforcement with the mortar itself and i'll show you later on um, in the video how this is achievable so the reason that they incorporate steel into masonry is to enable the full structure to achieve higher strengths. Station three for today is where I'll be talking about the different materials that can be used in masonry structures. So there's four main types of materials that are used when you have a masonry structure. You can have your masonry structure made of clay bricks. You can have your masonry structure made of stone. You can have it made of calcium silicate bricks, or you can have concrete blocks. And we'll be exploring each individual material separately. So starting off with clay bricks, it's probably the most common material that's used for masonry, your clay bricks. Um, it looks like the photo that you see in front of you. Generally speaking, it's used for easy works. So works that, you know, or structures that where you don't need them to be massively supported um, or that would support massive loads. Um, so for example, non load bearing walls, fences, and exterior facades sometimes. Now the brick itself can come in various um, sizes, but the standard block size is 230 mil by 110, and the height of it is 76 mil. Now remember, you need to add mortar, of course, to um, bound the individual units together. So you need to consider an additional 10 mil for your mortar on either end. Um, so the overall working size, it's basically adding an extra 10 mil to the previous dimensions. So they become 240 by 120 by 86. In terms of the layout of the brick, it's classified based on how it's laid. So we can see the, diff the various layouts. The most common layouts are the stretcher layout and the header. And you can see an example over here in this image. So this is a wall structure. You can see how these individual units, for example, are laid or are labeled as structure, whereas these top ones are labeled as header. So it depends on the orientation that the bricks are laid in. Uh, another label that you have to be aware of is the bedding. And that's basically that strip of mortar that connects the individual layers of bricks together. Moving on to concrete blocks, the advantages of having a masonry structure constructed from concrete blocks is the fact that they have a large loading capacity. So your load bearing walls would most probably be constructed from concrete blocks. Um, aesthetically, they look very, they have a very smooth finish. So, um, and that's desirable for a lot of clients. 
and also in terms of fire resistance, they're pretty good when it comes to resisting fire. Calcium silicate bricks, the advantages is that when it comes to solar heat effect, that's reduced. So they're commonly used in hot climates because they don't absorb much heat compared to uh, your clay bricks or your concrete blocks. Another advantage of the use of calcium silicate bricks is the fact that you need less mortar compared to the other types. Station four for today is where I'll be discussing several design principles when it comes to masonry. For masonry walls, they can come in various shapes, as you can see in the two photos in front of you. But when it comes to their design, we have to make sure that they satisfy standard requirements. And in Australia, the specific standards that we look at when it comes to masonry structure is AS3700. Now the standards are used for the design of masonry structures in order to achieve dur a durable structure and in order to achieve a structure that can resist the ultimate strengths that will be imposed um, on your structure. When it comes to detailing your masonry wall, and that's particularly important when you have steel reinforcement inserted into the uh, core of the structure. Again, you have to satisfy the specifications given in the standards. So this image that you see in front of you shows a section of the wall with the door located at the bottom over here. Now, the reason that you have these uh, steel bars is to uh, resist some of the tension. You've got to fill the hollow part of the brick uh, with grout, and that's how your steel will be linked to the overall structure. That's another example of detailing of reinforcement and how it's so the reinforcement in your wall and how it's connected to your foundation system. Um, and that's important, particularly when you have, you know, these walls, for instance, like a retaining wall that's connected to your footings. Again, these hollow structures within your concrete blocks need to be filled with grout or with the mortar, basically. As I said, the um, specifications when it comes to the design of masonry structures, we extract that from AS3700, the Australian Standards for Masonry Structures. Now this table in front of you shows you the characteristic impressive strength of masonry. What you will notice is that this strength depends on the type of masonry unit used in the structure. So uh, whether it's clay, concrete or calcium silicate, the bedding type as well will have an impact. So a full bedding, basically, you know, the mortar that connects your very, your different uh, layers of bricks versus a face shell. So a face shell is basically where you've got the mortar just covering the, the, the face of the brick rather than the full surface. Um, the characteristic compressive strength also depends on the mortar class. In Australia, there's three types of mortars. So it's M2, M3, M4. What makes, what differentiates these uh, mortar classes? Um, it's all depending on the amount of limestone that you have uh, in the mortar. And you can notice over here how, you know, the compressive strength um, varies. Of course, uh, 
these two Fs, they, they, two, they, they, they correspond to compressor strength. One is a characteristic compressor strength, and the other one, which you see over here in the, um, the labels of these individual columns, that's the unconfined compressive strength. Now we're not gonna go into the detail of the, of the, of the differences, but basically both are linked via an equation. So your structural designers would know more about this stuff. But for now, it's just important to realize that, you know, this particular characteristic compressive strength of masonry is influenced by the various types of masonry units adopted. Uh, durability requirements when it comes to your masonry structure. You'd have to look at the exposure environment. So, you know, a mild temperate environment is going to be different to uh, an industrial one, for example. Um, and so this table help, helps you specify, you know, the motor class that would be relevant for your uh, exposure environment, for the location of the, your masonry structure. So is it an interior structure? Is it an exterior structure? That will, you know, have an influence on the motor class. You would also need to uh, determine whether your masonry structure will be prone to uh, salt attack. Um, and that's mostly due to structures that are located close to the coast. So these are some of the measures that you would need to consider when it comes to assessing the durability of the final masonry structure. Now, as I said, there's three classes of mortar in Australia, M2, M3, M4. Um, different classes have different applications. So for example, M4 mortar class is used for masonry structures that are adopted as retaining walls or below the ground walls. External, external structures that are above ground walls you'd use M3 as the mortar. And then for M2, for M2 mortars, it's mostly, again, for external structures above ground walls or even internal ones, and they have to be non-load bearing. You notice over here that you're given also the type of masonry unit to adopt. So you can have clay, concrete, or limestone, and it's applicable for all three classes of mortar. Now, these images over here, they're just to explain some of the requirements that are listed in this table. The, um, probably the, uh, a couple of the important ones, which I'll just briefly explain above grade or below grade, that basically means uh, if it's below grade, then it's beneath your ground. If it's above grade, then it's exposed to the air. Uh, interior application, so anything inside your building, so not the exterior walls. Load bearing is any structure that will have loads imposed on it. So it will re be required to carry loads. Uh, non load bearing, on the other hand, these are structures where there's no loads exerted. So uh, structurally, we're not very concerned when it comes to non load bearing walls. And finally, an important concept to always bear in mind when you're designing any structure is fire resistance. Now, when it comes to masonry structures, the good thing about masonry structures is the fact that you can have double brick walls, for example, and you see an image over here. So this is one of your walls and then this is the other. You'll notice that there's a space between the two layers of walls um, and that cavity, so the space between the walls, that creates your fire resistance. And that's always important to get you know, the spacing correct 
um, that space can also sometimes be filled with um, some sort of insulating material for heat um, especially you know when you're trying to save on you know uh, air conditioning energy consumption but the main advantage of having that cavity space between your two walls is to resist fire station five is where i'll be talking about the individual masonry units so we've examined in the previous stations um, different masonry structures and requirements when it comes to uh, design so your typical masonry units they can come in various types the most common type is a solid masonry unit where you don't usually have any spacing so it's just a complete solid block remember that for all of these types that you see in front of you you can have them as clay calcium silicates or concrete blocks however what you see adopted in the industry is brick the clay bricks for solid cord and that horizontal cord type whereas your concrete blocks would mostly look like this hollow structure now the reason that we have these gaps is because sometimes we need to reinforce our walls as we described in a previous station and to make sure that we are able to pass the steel rios through the structure we need these holes why the different layouts and the different sizes of uh, individual brick units well it all depends on the load capacity so how much loading is exerted on your structure will determine the size that you would adopt for your masonry units and also and whether you want the individual units to have cores or hollow areas in them the aesthetics as well they play a role plus the application so for example if you had a masonry structure that's located exterior to the building and that was non load bearing so for example a fence it's a different type of masonry units that you would adopt contrasted with an internal wall where you have to carry loads so um, another thing that would impact the choices of these individual masonry units is whether the structure was going to be located below the ground or above the ground and these are some of the factors that you need to consider Station six for today and the final station is where I'll be describing brick bonds. So what are brick bonds? For any particular masonry structure, if you look at it from the outside, what you notice is that there's a uniform sizing that creates a regular pattern and that pattern repeats itself. So that's the brick bond that I'm referring to it's basically that pattern that you see in these masonry structures it's important to achieve that pattern because through interlocking each row of brick you achieve the full capacity uh, that's required to withstand loads and to make sure that the structure doesn't collapse there are four main types that are used in Australia the running bond the common bond the English bond and the Flemish bond there are subtle differences between them, but we'll ex examine each one briefly in today's lecture. So starting off with a running bond. A running bond pattern is seen in front of you. What you notice is that there are bricks that are staggered by half a brick from the course above and below. So half a brick from above and below so half of this brick is covered by the above brick 
and again half of it is covered by this uh, below brick in other words it's a classic one over two pattern so one brick over two bricks so this brick is supported by this brick on its left lower left and lower right and this pattern keeps on repeating so you'll notice that happening in any of the rows. If we take a look at this brick, for example, in that row, again, it's supported by a lower left brick and a lower right brick. Now for a common bond, it's sort of the same as the running bond. So in the middle of the structure, it's, this, it's similar to a running bond. The only difference that we notice is this row over here and that row. So every couple of rows, so your usual running bond rows, you'd have one row where you'd lay down the bricks in the header orientation. Remember when we talked about you know the different orientations of um, your masonry units, we said that it's either going to be a stretcher which is what we see over here or a header where you have the brick lying with its end facing out and now you'd have a, a whole row where the brick lies as a header and that would happen every you know four to five a rows of stretcher bricks so that's the common bond pattern an english bond you can see the english bond over here now with the english bond it's similar to the common bond however this time we see that the our header layer is adopted every other row so starting out from here there's a header row and then we change to the stretcher row and then we move back to the header row and then back to the stretcher row etc and that pattern keeps on repeating contrast that english bond pattern with the common bond pattern that we were talking about in the previous slide and you'll notice that the difference is that now you've got more headers so more headers more of these rows in your english bond compared to your common bond Finally, for today, the Flemish bond. Um, and the uh, Flemish bond is one where you've got a header and then stacked next to a stretcher. So a header, stretcher, header, stretcher, header, stretcher. And each row is basically comp composed of that. And that pattern repeats. So in today's lecture, I described to you masonry as a construction material we talked about the various uh, masonry units the materials that make up these individual masonry units um, i also briefly explained um, how masonry structures are designed with reference to as3700 and then we also talked about at the end the uh, the bond the brick bond and the pattern that's important to ensure that your bricks interlock with one another.